champion, rock and roll hero, Tommy Von Voy. <laughs> good to have you How's back. How's it going? Man. Good. Thank you. It's, it's good to be back. I appreciate it. Yeah. So we just had Jack Holloway on the show and we were talking about the social political commentary and part of the legacy of what is Black Sabbath. Yeah. And special thanks to you for giving me that contact and giving me the recommendation. Yeah. yeah but we yeah, got to talk so about welcome, yeah. them as musicians. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Jack's book is fascinating, uh, absolutely. But sometimes I, I also just want to just turn the records on and just crank them up and not really yeah. worry about what the lyrics are about. So, <laughs> so yeah, let's uh, let's get into it. Uh, do you want to start at the beginning of their career? Or this, yeah, there's so let's many start fascinating from the very things. beginning. So yeah. there's this bluesy jam band called Earth. And from the sounds of it, they were uh kind of your typical 60s band and mm -hmm. they were playing multiple shows a day for fish and chips or scraping by with some money and then afterwards this guy tony iomi got who worked in a factory got uh some of his fingertips clipped off and it turned out to be the most incredible accident in rock and roll history. He made these metal fingertips. He was heavily encouraged by one of his bandmates, Ozzy Osbourne. And then afterwards, with the inspiration of horror movies and the decision to start writing their own music, they formed this band named after a movie nowadays. I think a lot of people would probably find comical if they watched it, Black Sabbath. Well, yeah, um, now comes the point in the interview where I'm going to terribly disappoint you because almost all of that is incorrect. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Why I started doing this. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Actually, you know, it, it's actually, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you said all that because that's such a perfect example of the mythology that springs up around these iconic bands and how you know legendary bands some, sometimes they came to be how certain legendary albums came to be how certain iconic sounds came about um sometimes fiction is just much more enjoyable than truth but there a lot of what you said is rooted in reality it just gets a little scrambled and and kind of you know spruced up a little bit over time so Tony did indeed have that accident at the factory, and it was allegedly his last day at the sheet metal factory, but it was back in 1965 when he was only 17 years old. And he thought that his career was absolutely over when that happened, uh, and he'd only been playing guitar for about two or three years. And of course, as you know, he plays left-handed. So the hand that the fingertips got sliced off on was his right hand. As a left-handed guitarist, that would have been his fretting hand. And so he was just despondent. And the people at the sheet metal factory, they felt so terrible for him that they offered him like a really cushy position. They knew he was about to leave and become a professional musician. They just felt awful. And one of his supervisors calls him into his office and says, I want you to hear this record. It's this jazz guitarist named Django Reinhardt. And Tony says, I'm just not interested. I got, you know, that sounds cool. I don't want to listen to some good guitar player. And he's like, no, 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 no. You have to come, just come into my office and just listen to it. So he puts it on and Tony's like, yeah, this guy sounds incredible. And the guy goes, he only has two fingers that he can use because of a fire that disfingered his hand. And that, like the whole idea, he was trying to inspire Tony, like, please don't give up, man. So that's when Tony got the idea to, to form the little things to go over his fingertips and keep going. When he looked back on it much, much later in his career, because he used to get asked all the time, why didn't you just switch to being a right-handed guitar player? <laughs> and he felt at the time like that would have been absolutely impossible. Like he tried it and it just didn't work. So he gave up and he was like, no, I'll figure out my fingers. And he says, looking back on a decades long career, he wished he had actually only two years, three years in, had just switched to right-handed. Like if he could go back and do it all over again, he would have just switched. Um, so yeah, so, that was in 65 so he kept playing in different touring like you know gigging regular professional gigging bands and then in 67 i believe it was they formed the polka Telk blues band and that is what that is the band that featured him and geezer and bill 
and Ozzy and two other guys, a slide guitarist and a saxophone player. And they gigged twice with that lineup and Tony felt the sax player and the slide guitarist didn't have the dedication or the commitment to go the long haul. So rather than fire the guys, they decided to break up and then just reform as a four piece without telling them. And that became, that became the band called Earth. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. All right. That's, <laughs> that's pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Um, the fingers thing is really interesting because that always factors so heavily into discussions about, you know, the, the creation of heavy metal and down tune guitars and just you know so much about what made black sabbath black sabbath but the funny thing is is the first black sabbath record is all in standard tuning so is paranoid they didn't drop tuning until they were gigging heavily on tour after the first album and it wasn't until master of reality in 1971 that they tuned all the way down to c sharp standard so tony definitely felt that bending the strings was easier for him with his messed up fingertips if you tune down because the, the strings are just looser feeling. But initially what he did to combat the problem is he just played lighter gauge strings. Nice, nice. Yeah. Well done. Shows you just, just how well uh, an equalizer can balance things out for you as a, right. <laughs> as a guitar yes. player. Yep, 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 yep. Play through the right cranked up stack and uh, it sounds really heavy even if you're playing sevens or eights. So. Yeah. And yeah. to the viewers who don't know those, that's referring to the gauge of the strings. So the lower the number that you use to describe the pack of strings, it means the skinnier they are, the lighter they are. And the lighter the string, the easier it is to push them and to bend your notes and get that bluesy kind of vibrato. Yeah. Um, and uh, like normally it's pretty standard for a lot of rock guys to be using like 10 gauge strings. That's very common, yeah. That's typically kind of a standard. Uh, heavier bands will, like really heavy metal bands, will go into like 11s and 12s. Oh, yeah. And then we have some rockers like Brian May who can graciously play on eight gauge strings with sawed off pennies. Yes. And then you got guys like Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top who's playing on sevens. But his tone sounds fantastic. So. Yeah. Yeah, you know, tone really sometimes can be in the fingers. Yep, it really does. It all boils down. I think what it was, um, there was a guy, there's a former uh, spinal surgeon I used to play guitar with, and um, he showed me like I was. There's one point I was like so obsessed with trying to figure out some blues tones, and BB King was one of them, and he literally just turns down the treble and then the bass, and he goes, "So if you want to be able to figure that tone out, you just." figure out how to play it with these. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. It's like, that's the secret. I'm like, that oh, is okay. the secret. It's like, now turn it all, and he's like, turn the volume all the way up, and so, there yeah, it really does display, you know, and sometimes it really just boils down to your fingers, the player themselves. Um, yeah. So where did they go from there like tony uses lighter gauge strings they're easier for his messed up hands they're playing in a standard they've got this super heavy sound yeah so the super super heavy sound and again that's another one of those things people always refer back to the factory accident as like oh and then they drop their tuning and they're heavy and they invented heavy metal and Again, that sounds so romantic when you say that. So I can't blame people for perpetuating that. It's just such a cool story. But what actually happens, and, and in fact, here's the thing. When, when, people, when people say that, it basically gives credit to the creation of heavy metal to an accident. And the reality is they actually kind of did it on purpose. So they're playing in standard tuning at this point in time. If we're here now, we're in 1969. They're now, they've, uh, they're still calling the, the band is still called Earth, which Ozzy hated the name. And they were aware of that movie, Black Sabbath. And they decided to write a song that was based around the tritone. So that boom, boom, which is the riff for that song, Black Sabbath. 
So they came up with that riff and Ozzy and Geezer worked on the lyrics and it was about the movie and just really dark, ominous, terrifying stuff. And they had never written any music like that before. They were doing basically standard bluesy rock kind of stuff of the time. And they were so blown away by what they had created, they decided, well, let's change the name of the band to Black Sabbath and let's just start writing nothing but material that sounds like this because it sounds like the soundtrack of a horror movie. Let's try to write really scary music. And that's how they actually created what now retroactively we look back and realize is doom metal. But at the time, it was just basically, you know, the beginnings of heavy metal as, as it were to come to be. So it wasn't an accident that created it. They actually consciously wrote that song and liked it so much. They're like, let's do this again. And then let's do it again and again and again and again. <laughs> And then, yeah. and what's crazy is like we're talking only five some odd months after that, their debut album comes out in like February of 1970. And that's just mind blowing that it just happened that quickly after they created that first song. And they're like, this is what we're going to do. This is amazing. Let's keep exploring this. Five months later, they make music history. Yeah. That's really wild that it happened that quickly, too. Yeah. Um, was there a like, did, did you know about the writing process that it, they went into and why it kind of snowballed into making that five month period or just because they I'm, lived in a time period where you're working class and social media doesn't exist. And if you have a dream, you might as well try and make it happen as fast as possible. I mean, I think that you're dealing with now at this point in time, they're a band that was just a professional full-time band. I mean, I'm sure that they were making absolute peanuts if they were lucky. At a good gig, they were earning peanuts. Yeah. But they were they were just full time. They were just in it. They were the, probably the classic example of you know a bunch of you know grimy dudes living in some nasty flat where they're also rehearsing and they just they wake up, they jam all day, they go to sleep. The next morning, they wake up, they jam all day, and then they go to sleep. When you're living in that environment and when you're also that suddenly inspired, I think the music can suddenly start flowing out of you. And I think that's what we saw there. It's just, it's just a spurt of inspiration from them. Yeah. Yeah, they created some really, they did create some incredible music. I mean, still to this day, it's just so heavy and mesmerizing. And it there really is. is. So much, many dramatic, cinematic, but then just cool. You can just crank the stereo as loud as possible and just rock out with your friends. Yeah. What's cool is when you listen to the first couple of Sabbath records, too, is you can actually, if you listen to them in chronological order, you are hearing the evolution of this. You're hearing them actually work their way through the sound. I mean, from the very first album with that first song, and the whole album is just this incredibly heavy, ominous, almost demonic blues kind of thing. There's still real serious blues undertones there. You can't avoid them. And then the very next album, Paranoid, which came out later in that year, I believe in 1970, you could hear how much they evolved over the course of like six months in their writing. And then by the time they get to Master of Reality the next year and they're tuning down to C-sharp standard and everything is so much heavier and so much more aggressive and sludgy. I mean, in real time, you're hearing them figure out what is this style that we've discovered and that we're exploring. And they're just like, there, you could hear it evolving over the course of a couple of albums in just a couple of years. It's really incredible, really. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that that technical and tonal change as they explore it uh, throughout the albums as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. The thing that kind of captivates me within the early years is they have these, I mean, so they have these like really uh, just heavy, doomy, dismal sounding songs like war pigs and then they will hop skip and jump and they have songs like paranoid and it's like this is a song that you can almost dance to and then they have songs like the wizard where ozzy's totally ripping it on the harmonica and it gets like right after he, it's like the second he's done playing the harmonica which is kind of like this lonesome travelers kind of tone you would hear out of like a Sonny Boy Williamson song. And then suddenly just boom, here comes the band. The second the harmonica stops, 
and it's just heavy and it's in your face and it's this wall like sound uh do you know what they were doing besides just from you know lighter strings like in terms of, like on a technical standpoint what they were doing to help create that tone so you i mean each member is really contributing equally to that uh you start with bill ward on drums his approach he plays slightly behind the beat and I'm, i have to be careful when i say that because i don't want to make it seem like i'm insulting his style because it's absolutely not it's something he's intentionally doing and what that does is it adds such a massive amount of weight to the sound it's it's very subtle you wouldn't know it unless you really put in the work to listen for it but it's there and it just makes everything seem just enormous and just like it weighs a thousand pounds a geezer butler has a massive massive room filling bass tone which honestly you really need if you have a band that is effectively a three piece just bass drums guitar obviously ozzy on top of that is the fourth you don't band. have a rhythm guitarist filling out the sound you got tony doing double duty now tony we talked about this when we talked about you know a lot of the roots of, of hard rock and heavy metal and talking about how amps were evolving and how guitar players were pushing them harder and harder so Tony was using Laney Supergroup amps, cranking them. Just take, basically, you just, it was the old trick was you just take your hand and just take the palm and just run it across all the dials so they're just and across the board. And then hitting it out front with a treble booster. And a treble booster isn't necessarily doing what you think it does. You hear the word treble booster and you think, well, it's going to make my guitar sound incredibly bright. Not so much it's what's more important is it's it's boosting the mid ranges and the treble frequencies it's cutting the bass frequencies and it's hitting the guitar amp with a much hotter signal than just a simple guitar can actually do and that will cause the amp to go into much more saturated overdrive that coupled with the fact that he was actually just absolutely cranking it to oblivion his guitar tone was a massive wall of overdriven fuzzy doomy sludgy glorious noise and that made the black sabbath sound in the early days okay so he's creating this just like overly saturated fuzzy distorted mess just enormous okay. yeah just by enormous. maxing everything out max everything out hit it with a treble booster just playing as loud and as overdriven as possible geezer butler on bass just enormous room filling earth shaking bass tone and you got Bill Ward back there just being ever so slightly behind the beat where you would expect him. It's not like he's, it's not like they're playing to a click track or to, a, you know, to program drums and snap to a grid, you know? It's so loud out, just loud out, out. It's just enormous. That's, that definitely uh, helped paint a really great image, though, uh, with how the band all executed it. Um, so Laney amps, uh, I feel like that's a very, uh, under, under recognized amplifier, uh, in terms of what it has done, uh, musically, um, how, how, how are we comparing differences between, so we just talked about Marshall's, mm -hmm. uh, but the difference between like a Marshall amp, which, you know, most iconic brand out there thing that you see next to everybody, um, how did that uh differ from its more popular counterparts at the time to help contribute uh to the overall sound of black sabbath well boy you know i don't want to risk uh upsetting any any diehard laney uh fanboys but um i feel as though tony could have easily gotten the same results with a marshall super lead at the time i do uh Guitar amps were still relatively primitive in the late 60s. And they were all effectively going to be doing about the same thing when you crank them up to max and you hit them that hard. It just happened to be that that's what Tony ended up using. Now, a Laney circuit is not necessarily exactly the same as a Marshall. They were kind of doing a little bit their own thing, sort of the way High Watt was doing its own thing, Vox was doing its own thing, Fender had its own circuits they were putting out. Orange had its own thing going on. And at one point, you could see in videos of Sabbath, you could see them having orange amps in the back line, too. So they did mess with those. The thing about Laney is they kind of, I believe at some point, they just started chasing what was becoming popular. 
And when you get to, say, the 80s and the 90s, they were putting out amps that were effectively just Marshall JCM 800 circuits with an added tube for more distortion. Because they knew that's what was hot, that's what guitarists wanted, and they needed to make money. But at the time, they kind of had, in, in the late 60s, early 70s, they kind of had their own thing going on. Now, just like in the, those slight uh, differences, would you say this might have been like a brighter amp, a less punchier amp, a darker amp, uh, more bassier? If, I mean, if Tony had done it with a Marshall, it could have potentially been a little bit brighter. Yeah, you know, when you crank a Marshall Super Lead, sometimes they're so bright you have to have the treble on zero, the presence on zero, and it's still so bright it's cutting your head right off. <laughs> so that's that's entirely possible. It could have just been a brighter tone, but I think it would have every bit it would have been every bit as heavy for sure. Every bit as heavy. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so in terms of like the you know we're gonna go through the uh, those first couple of albums. Um, what technically s stands out to you as a musician? Um, I mean, back in the la the first interview we did, I mean, I've got clips of you and your band playing. I mean, you guys are all over the place. You can play. You guys are doing all this like crazy Eddie Van Halen like stuff already, which is just uh, you know technical beyond belief. Um, but what? Uh, but what but what were these guys doing in terms of a the actual musicianship uh that differed you know aside from that marvelous descriptive you just gave of how the band played um you know progressions different mm -hmm. kinds of writing that uh strays them from the mold there is one thing that they did back then that I think might be surprising to some people there's more of a jazz influence than you'd realize you especially start hearing that on some of the really extended workouts on the paranoid album um there's some really interesting chords that tony is doing and some chords that actually tony can't play still to this day because of the finger industry which is in finger in, in injury which is an interesting thing but uh yeah they do some interesting jazzy things in uh along the way of, of creating heavy metal that you wouldn't expect a band like them to do especially coming from the blues background they do and that's pretty cool that's pretty cool um as far as ooh, technical you know tony tony does not get the credit that he deserves still to this day and which is funny that i say that because the guy's an absolute legend but when you think about what he had to overcome and on that first sabbath record he's absolutely just ripping it apart he is i mean that's some of the earlier examples of shredding if you listen to it I mean, it's just it's blues shredding but it's shredding nonetheless think about what he could have done if he hadn't cut the tips of his fingers off how good he could have been and he's already incredible um here's something else that's technically interesting about those early sabbath records i wonder if you've ever noticed this what ozzy is doing vocally in fact, the best way you can notice this is you compare the Ozzy era albums to the Dio era albums. Listen to the vocal melodies on the Ozzy era albums. And Ozzy is almost always basically singing the melody that the riff is playing. Which adds like this extra layer of like insanity on top of the riff. Whereas what Dio does and what most people would do is they'll sing across the riff. They'll come up with a counter melody something that goes on top of what the instrumentation is but isn't just mimicking it but the ozzy era stuff doesn't really do that think about um think about iron man yeah he's completely he in. lost his head down, 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 down. he does that a lot and it's a weird approach that they took but it's kind of one of the things that you subconsciously immediately associate with the earlier ozzy era sabbath yeah no there's yeah no you yeah, Iron Man is a good point. Uh, the song that first comes to mind when you say that is like Electric Funeral. You know, that really dredgy, slow, depressive sounding. Everything's dead. There's no emotion. There's no character. Mm -hmm. As they're singing about the threat of, you know, the nuclear arms race. Um, and he's going on about it. It's this robotic sound that's synced in completely with with the guitar melody being played mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah. So yeah, it, um, it makes things kind of creepy in a way. It, it is. It's like when it's really the. It's kind of funny. Like the the older I'm, I keep getting like the things. There's a lot of things that creep me out less and less, or get under my skin less and less. Uh, it's so much so not to. I'm just gonna knock on wood so I don't jinx myself here. But it, it's almost at a point where I, I, I'm not. I haven't seen a horror movie within the last couple of. I haven't really within the last like I'd say four years. I've not watched a horror movie that's gotten under my skin or creeped me out or kept me from sleeping. Like, I remember when I saw The Witch for the first time in 2020, everybody was telling me how freaked out they were by watching it. And I went to bed, like, 10 minutes after finishing it. Like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, that was a good movie. He just went right back to bed. But it's <laughs> one of those songs that, to me, the uncanniness, like, still, it still unsettles me when I listen to it. Um, because of just how, like, how well tuned in his voice is with the song and how yeah. characterized because we're yeah. so used to listening to to like the emotion and the expression within even if somebody sucks at singing like we're, we're so used to there's a type of expression and because that there's that lack of expression and there's that lack of human emotion suddenly it it gets really weird and freaks you out well because it sounds like gosh for lack of a better way to describe it, it sounds like there's something wrong with the guy you know you listen to those records and as awesome as those records are if you if you really take a step back and listen to what ozzy's doing if you, you almost want to go like why would you do this this what, what's what is wrong with you man <laughs> but but in the context of black sabbath that's an asset not a detriment so yeah it's, it's no, pretty that cool is. it's crazy um so you know moving past you know like the paranoid album um the rest of the ozzy era what were like you're talking about like obviously there's a jazz influence that kicks in um would that be like uh reinhardt's influence on um on tony on I'm sure that there must have been a little bit of that going on. Yeah, they were just also just really curious people, though. They just like to explore new things. As you start getting further into the Aussie era catalog, you know, you get to volume four in 1972. You get to Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath in 1973. I mean, around there, you, you kind of think, it kind of sounds like they realized that they had explored the let's tune down to C sharp and just beat the living crap out of that low string. Like they felt like they'd explored that enough and now they needed to kind of just spread their wings a little bit and kind of just explore the space and uh, they start getting really proggy around around this time um which you know the thing about that is so many people were getting proggy at that point in time it's almost like now they're not innovating anymore now they're just a band of the time which kind of tracks in a way you have to figure out, I'm, I'm like working my way through all this in real time right in front of you. This kind of tracks with what they were going through as a band too, because at this point, they're very, very successful. Tons of money, so much drugs. They, I mean, the cocaine that this band did. Probably could kill an elephant. It could kill a herd of elephants. And there was a lot of interpersonal drama uh, if you start, if you look at live footage of them around 73, 74, you could start seeing where they're, they're doing this thing, which is deeply bizarre, where Tony Iommi is standing in the center where normally the lead singer would go, and he's got Ozzy off to the side of the stage singing lead vocals. Like, the, they, they kind of weren't in a good headspace, and their music starts getting mm, more adventurous, proggy, and then kind of starts getting to be the point where it's just all over the place. So as they became more of a mess of a band, their music starts getting messier and less focused as you get deeper into the 70s. And that's probably one of the main reasons why people consider the first five Ozzy era records to be really the definitive must-haves 
when you get to 1975 sabotage that album's got some great stuff on it and some some not great stuff and then we get to 1976 with technical ecstasy which at that point they tuned back up to standard tuning because reasons and that record is them kind of trying to sound like a like a late 70s rock band they weren't really really trying to be heavy metal anymore or or doom and then ozzy leaves or gets fired whoever you want to believe and then they start working on another album with this other singer and then it wasn't working out so they get ozzy back and ozzy doesn't want to work on any of the material they wrote with the other guys so now they have to write a whole new album all over again and that becomes 1978's never say die which sucks and then they fire ozzy because at that point ozzy's substance abuse issues are just completely out of control and that's one of those moments i i always love moments like that when like it kind of like when guns and roses fired steven adler for being an addict it's like when guns and roses tells you you have a drug problem <laughs> you know when when black sabbath in 1979 says we think you're drinking too much and using too many drugs <laughs> like that's saying something that's not good man <laughs> But um, but yeah, as you know, as they as they get deeper into the '70s, they get more adventurous. They're exploring more musical styles, and then they just completely lose focus. Really, it's it's kind of unfortunate. They just really lost their way by the end. And by the end of that decade, a lot of musicians were starting to view them as dinosaurs because you had the punk explosion, and the punk explosion comes along, and they look at stuff like Sabbath, like you're you're dinosaurs, get out of the way. You're yesterday's news um you're tired you're old you know these guys are all in their late 20s but you're tired you're old like okay and van halen and they, comes out as well at that point they were the new dominating force which it's funny that you mentioned that i don't know if you if you're aware of this already but van halen one of their earliest things that they did after that first album came out is they were black sabbath's opening act yep and they consistently blew sabbath off the stage they did. There was one famous show where Ozzy was so overworked. He went, there was a hotel that they were staying at, and he was one floor off, and he fell asleep. He was up for like 30 hours or something like that, literally falls asleep, and there was a riot that got started because, or a small-scale riot that occurred after Van Halen played because the crowd was so worked up, and sabbath couldn't figure out where ozzy was and the crowd like eventually began a riot because <laughs> they couldn't they wanted come out to and see play. Sabbath. oh no oh ozzy yeah. oh ozzy yeah so uh. it, it got it got pretty pretty wild <laughs> uh that so just, um yeah, yeah so like what was uh so, so they, so they kind of disbanded for a little bit, but then Dio joins. Well, yeah, I mean, they fired Ozzy at that point because they realized it was a mistake taking him back and doing that Never Say Die record. He was just a wreck. And now they're like, what the hell do we do? You know, they're not going to just go get day jobs or start some different band. They really had no idea what the hell to do. They just knew they couldn't go forward with Ozzy. So it was really one of those, like, just like the perfect the planetary alignment just occurred because Dio had just recently either fired, been fired or quit from Rainbow because he just could not work with Richie Blackmore anymore. Dio summed it up as Richie Blackmore decided he wanted to be a rock star and blah, 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 or whatever. You know how you know how these this this band drama goes. But oh, yeah. uh, so Dio was newly freed up many of his obligations and he was just hanging out in LA with no idea what the hell his next move was going to be some of the guys from Sabbath were hanging out in LA no idea what their next moves were going to be and somebody decided to link them up Dio came in um, they had been working on a song that became Children of the Sea and they had they said Ronnie why don't you have a go at this see what you can come up with and before the session was over he had like turned it into Children of the Sea and they knew that they were onto something and my god they were and really, it is, you know, it's truly the best thing that could have happened to all parties involved. That Ozzy got fired, that Sav needed a new singer, that Dio quit Rainbow. Because on paper, 
none of these things are good things. Like those first couple of Rainbow albums with Ronnie James Dio are incredible. Like it, I wouldn't want that to end. You know, Ozzy and Black Sabbath, like who wants, who wants that to stop? You know, the idea of Ozzy getting fired and being off on his own in some motel room, just drug binging, well, that's going to end in death. But it didn't. The Sabbath gets Ronnie James Dio and they put out two records with Ronnie James Dio that are incredible. Ozzy goes solo and the music that we got from Ozzy's solo career is incredible. So who knew that this would have actually worked out so well for all parties involved, us included as fans? Yeah, and funny enough, I mean, those those albums would inspire like new generations of guitar players. Oh, um, they absolutely did. Yeah. yeah like well, and also, well, Sabbath, Sabbath basically changed what kind of band they were when they switched to Dio. They weren't a doom metal band anymore. At that point, Sabbath became a heavy metal band. So what made the Dio era differ from Ozzy? Like, obviously, you just said the difference between their singing, but what changes with the music when Dio comes into the picture? Well, a few things. Uh, first of all, well, now they're in a different tuning again. Now they're in E-flat <laughs> because reasons. So for the two Dio records, they're in E-flat tuning. Um, but Dio is a songwriter that Ozzy never was. Ozzy, Ozzy would come up with melodies, but Ozzy was never really a songwriter. So those Ozzy solo albums, that is the work of Bob Daisley and Randy Rhodes and Lee Kerslake. Not really Ozzy. So now they're working with a songwriter in Ronnie James Dio, coming out of that sword and sorcery thing that he was doing with Richie Blackmore and Rainbow, and now they're exploring that. So they're working with a new major creative force in the band, in addition to somebody who sings completely differently. And it just completely changed the chemistry of the band. Such to the point that um, the drummer, Bill Ward, didn't totally love it and actually left after the first record they did with Dio, Heaven and Hell. And they did the tour for that record with Vinnie Apice. And they did Mob Rules with Vinnie Apice on drums because Bill Ward wasn't really totally feeling the new direction that they went in. That new direction was, like, how would you describe that new direction? Would it be like a more power sound, a more progressive sound? Uh, were they tighter? They were a lot tighter. It brought something out of Tony Iommi that we'd never heard before. And even though I'm giving him so many props for the stuff he had done on the Ozzy era Sab Sabbath records, just ripping it up with the blues shredding that he was doing, he his style kind of changed in the D.O. years. And what he was playing was more like what you would associate with proper heavy metal guitar playing. It's almost, God, it almost sounds like four different guys and only one of them changed. You know, it really brought something incredible out of that band that had obviously been within them all along. The potential had always been there, but they just didn't have the right pieces there. The chemistry wasn't right for that to come about. But yeah, it was a, it was definitely, it wasn't that it was a heavier sound. It was a more focused, more hard driving sound while still being heavy. And there was definitely an element that was more epic and fantastical about it. It was a little bit more dramatic. You can owe, you, well, you can thank Ron James Dio for that. And he came oh, into the sword and sorcery thing. And God, I, I mean, I love that. So. Yeah. No, it suddenly it's like the this whole mysticism and kind of like what the iconic imagery of what metal eventually became is like now shaped in this new album and this new era of Sabbath. Yeah. The thing about metal is it's always kind of had this uh, mystic quality to it in its visuals or in its descriptives you know like the visuals there's so many people there's um god there's some black metal band from boston who's just like technically off the charts and even though it looks like based on their imagery it just looks like something out of like a black magic manuscript they're <laughs> singing about political issues <laughs> they're singing about the environment <laughs> oh it's amazing yeah um, but this gets totally reshaped with Dio. And so, um, how did, you know, with the line, with the lineup change, now that they had a new drummer, what, what was brought into the band that wasn't there before? Well, I think that Vinnie Apice brought an even sharper, more focused, more aggressive sound. I think he just gave them kind of a kick in the ass as far as energy goes. Um, 
not so much a youthful kick in the ass, but just somebody who just wasn't as much of a personal disaster as Bill Ward was at that point. You gotta understand at this point in time, Bill Ward's alcoholism was out of control. He was in really, really bad shape. I'm actually kind of surprised he's still with us to this day because he could have died at any moment. When you think of the other rock stars that drank themselves to an early grave, Bon Scott, John Bonham, Bill Ward was heading down that same street. So with him out of the picture and somebody young and hungry in his place, you could hear that difference between the heaven and hell record and the mob rules. And it just makes it even more focused and even more hard driving and even more aggressive. I really love it. I, I, it's fantastic. To me, again, this was ultimately a positive. Not so much for Bill Ward, it wasn't a positive, <laughs> but it was a positive for the band and it was a positive for us as fans. Yeah. Now, with the remainder of the Dio years, um, how did how did Sabbath, uh, after that second album with Vinny coming into the picture, how did Vinny and Dio uh, reshape the music? Like how like what were the different directions that Sabbath took in now that they were focused, now that they were tighter, now that we were seeing things come out of Tony Iommi that no one didn't even know was even possible? Yeah, well, we'll never know because it didn't happen because after that second album while well, they were working on the live album the infighting between the members of the band got to the point where they broke up so i mean and this is one of those this is another one of those rock legends thing where it's a bit of a he said she said thing or in this case he said he said um they're they're working on the the live album live evil i believe it was and so the story goes, everyone's heads are still clouded from cocaine and just not getting along and egos being unchecked. That Ronnie would come in and work on mixing and like, you know, get the vocals really hot and then you'd go home and then Tony would come in like in the, in the evening and feel like Ronnie buried his guitar. So he would bury the vocal and raise the guitars off and just back and forth. Who the hell knows? Whatever coke fueled nonsense this was. So they broke up and now they didn't know what the heck to do because Ronnie took Vinny with him. And Ronnie and Vinny go off and they start the Dio band. And they got Vinny and Campbell and they got Jimmy Bain and they go off and they do Dio's solo career. And we all, you know, what the arc of that was. And, you know, the first couple of Dio solo albums are amazing. But now Sabbath is reduced to just Bill. I mean, not, not Bill, to just Geezer and Tony. So they get Bill Ward back on drums and they're like, well, let's maybe just start a new band at this point. So they needed a singer. God only knows why anyone thought this was a good idea, but they got Ian Gillen from Deep Purple. And they're like, let's just put a new band together with, with the four of us. And they worked on the material that became the Born Again album. And it's horrible. It is a horrible, bad, awful, no good album. The songs are terrible. The mix is horrible. I hate everything about this. I hate even the cover of this album is horrible with the screaming devil baby. I hate, hate, hate the Born Again album so much. And this is one of those situations where the record company was like, gee, guys, this sure is cool. You're calling it Black Sabbath. And they're like, well, I guess, fine. We still want a career. So out it goes as Black Sabbath. <laughs> and, this, and this lineup lasted one album and one tour. And then Bill quit again, and they got rid of Ian because it was a terrible fit. And they did the they did the tour without Bill. They got the they got I think Bev Bevan from Electric Light Orchestra was the drummer for the Born Again tour for Black Sabbath. <laughs> Electric Light Orchestra of all bands, of all things. They got that guy. So now the band is a mess, and now they lose Bill again. They don't have Ian now. Thank goodness. They don't have Ozzy. Dio's long gone. I think I think Geezer Butler bounces. So things get really messy now. So now Tony Iommi is going to do a solo album. And that is going to be called uh, Seventh Star. And that ends up coming out, I believe, in 86. Yeah, around 86. And it was just going to be a Tony Iommi solo release. And the record company was like, gee, that's swell. You're calling this Black Sabbath. We don't care about a Tony Iommi solo <laughs> You're calling this Black Sabbath. And uh, I think he got, 
who did he get on vocals? The guy that was Glenn Hughes, who played bass and co-sang lead vocals in later era Deep Purple in the 70s. He got Glenn Hughes to sing lead vocals on that album. And he fired Glenn Hughes four days into the tour because he was a drunk. So then he had to replace Glenn Hughes with Ray Gillen. And so they finished the tour for that record with Ray Gillen. They're still calling this Black Sabbath. It's, it's you know, it's Tony Iommi and Friends. And then they go to do a follow-up album, and they're going to call it Black Sabbath, and it doesn't work out with Ray Gillen. So Ray Gillen gets the axe or quits. Who knows? So then they get Tony Martin. <laughs> so Tony Martin joins the band in time for them to do The Eternal Idol in 1987. And when you listen to that record and the next couple of albums they did, with uh with uh tony martin which would be headless cross and tear 89 and i think 1990. tony martin's vocal style now tony martin is an incredible singer but what are they trying to sound like they're trying to sound like dio era black sabbath <laughs> so the long answer to your question of how did uh dio shape the sound he shaped him in his absence because they were just a mess after he was gone. And then when they finally regroup with a singer who is stable and Tony Martin, what do they try to do? They try to sound like at the Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules records. And I actually kind of really like some of the stuff on those Tony Martin records. They Most people overlook 80s era Sabbath after Dio leaves. And to some degree for good reason, especially some of the stuff off of what would have been the solo album and especially Born Again. But they put out some incredible stuff with Tony Martin that I can listen to and I'm like, God, I could totally hear Dio singing this stuff. This is amazing. But they weren't breaking any new ground. They weren't leading the pack at that point. At this point in the late 80s, now they're just sounding like what an 80s metal band should sound like, basically. And this is kind of par for the course with Legends, is they come out of the gate, leading the charge, breaking new ground, and then sadly, somewhere along the way, they start becoming like everybody else, and then they start chasing what everyone else is doing. We've seen that with people like Prince, we've seen that with people like Madonna, any number of bands. At a certain point, they're no longer the trendsetters. They start following what everyone else is doing because they have to hold on to the career, they have to hold on to the machine they've built. And that's absolutely what Sabbath was doing by the late 80s. Unfortunate casualty. And it's all the record company's fault. <laughs> to some degree, I blame it. A lot of it on the record company, some of it on drugs, some of it on egos. I mean, they did do a smart thing in the early 90s. They decided to get Dio back, and they did the Dehumanizer album. So they tried to regroup the Heaven and Hell lineup to do that again, with actually with Ronnie. But infighting broke that up again. At one point, they were supposed to play a festival opening for Ozzy solo, and Ronnie was like, I refuse to open for that man. He's a buffoon. He's a clown. So he wouldn't go on stage. So they had to go on and play and they got Rob Halford to come out and sing lead vocals. And he's got like all the lyrics to all the songs taped to the floor of the stage and all over the wedges. And so they got Rob, if you see the footage of that, Rob Halford's up on stage, just, you know, ah! and he's looking at the lyrics right in front of him, in front of thousands of people because he had like an hour's notice to fill in for Ronnie who wouldn't go on stage. Wow. It never <laughs> ends. This stuff never, ever ends, man. <laughs> it's, it's like the never ending comedy. Oh my it God. It truly is. And it's, it's, it's hysterical, but it's also sad too. It's like, God, you guys, how many people would give anything to be in your shoes, to be able to have that as your, as your, as your career, to be up on yeah. stage playing this music and your egos and all this bullshit drama gets in the way and just sabotages it every step of the way. And you can Monday morning quarterback a band's whole career and look at it and like what the hell was wrong with you guys? yeah exactly yeah no i mean i think also too i mean like in in part was you know some of those bands are starting to burst out i mean the unfortunate the true killer of Jimi hendrix was was his manager mike jeffries oh it was mike okay so i confused the two so mike jeffries yeah he was the one he was the real killer of, of Jimi. And I think that's kind of like the prime warning of people who want to try and go big in the entertainment industry is that there's a lot of really insane, or not, not insane, just evil, manipulative people that will just say yes, dope you up or keep you supplied. Um, and they'll run off with all your money. And <clears throat> there was, I mean, there's a number of other people. I mean, like, 
Janice Joplin was just surrounded by yes men. That's why she drank herself to death. Because nobody was actually concerned with her well-being. You see that happen with Aerosmith too. Yeah. When they were Aeros- I mean, players. Aerosmith's true. There's no one like being like, guys, come on, like call it an early night, give it quits. Like no one ever did anything like that at any point. Well, because as long as they knew that they could at least push them out on stage, no matter what state they were in, enough to get through a few bars of walk this way in sweet emotion, the management team knew they were getting paid. And it's horrible. It's monstrous. It really is. And Sabbath really never really had truly stable management or anyone that was really a true advocate for them. You know, what's really though inspiring is when you see bands that actually did get so fortunate as to have that. Like I, the one that comes to mind immediately for me is Iron Maiden. I believe the guy's name is Rod Smallwood. And he's yeah. been with them their entire career. And he's always been their champion, always had their back. He was the guy fighting for them since day one. That's what you need. And it's so hard to know if that's who you're signing an agreement with, unfortunately. Yeah, it sucks. Um yeah, because I mean, it's like sometimes you're also in a situation too where you kind of, now that you sign the dotted line, you got to succumb to what they say yep. or you're going to get shelved. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great observation you're making. And it's something a lot of people don't really consider is how much that can make or break an artist. And in some cases, it can end up killing them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, I think that definitely too. I mean, looking back on it because there are other people that have like been in and out with some of with some of sabbaths and uh some of these guys careers like like zach wild uh ozzy's uh his or has been ozzy's primary guitar guy for a while um and there's videos literally of that guy chugging a full bottle of jack daniels right as he's going on stage and uh funny enough i mean he had three blood clots pass through his heart because he drank so much his blood got that thin yeah at one point his doctors told him your circulatory system is such a mess you are literally going to die if you don't stop drinking yeah his body simply could not process it anymore yeah where was somebody earlier than that why did it take his doctors having an intervention with him where were the where were the management where was the management team the people that are with him day in and day out where's the road manager where's somebody pulling him aside saying, look, I don't want you to leave this world, man. You've got to slow down. Yeah. And unfortunately we lost a lot of, a lot of musicians out of the last century because of it. Um, particularly when we go before uh, the flower power era, um, there were a lot of blues and R and B and jazz musicians that slipped into either morphine, heroin, or alcohol and, Whatever we got out of them at that time is what we got out of them. Yeah, there's very few because exceptions. Like very few exceptions. Yeah. Yeah, we've got like exceptions like um, Buddy Holly uh, or um, Randy Rhodes, who died purely by accident with an airplane. But as far as everybody else goes, I mean, it was like you know nobody, nobody ever. <laughs> No one ever called him out. No one ever told him, hey, you got to go get cleaned up. You need to go get some help. Well, you know, uh, and none of this is going to be excuse making. So don't please don't misconstrue it as such. But you've got a management team who they're afraid of rocking the boat. They need to make sure that they keep getting paid because now they've got financial obligations or just because they've gotten used to this lifestyle they have or just because they don't want to piss off their artists who will then leave and that's their that's their their you know that's their bread and butter or maybe other artists follow suit or any number of reasons or maybe they're just plain greedy and don't care and then you've got all the people that surround these artists you describe as yes men and that's very common and no one wants to be the person that kills the party that harshes anybody's good time because then they might get cast out of the inner circle no one wants to be the voice of reason on the road crew of everybody, including the road crew, is partying because now all of a sudden you're not a part of the road crew anymore. Everyone's afraid of doing what's the right thing to do because of selfish reasons, really. But I understand why that happens. It's just horrible. But that's what leads to this. That's how you can be surrounded by people who all can see you going down a bad path 
and no one wants to be the one that speaks up because they're all afraid that if they do, they'll be cast out of the inner circle. And that can happen. You know, that has, that has happened. There have been there have been artists who did have people that step in and say, hey, you guys, you know, I'm, I'm worried about you. And all of a sudden they're not invited to, to play the reindeer games anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. unfortunate. Yeah. Um, now, looking back on, uh, I, I don't know if Sabbath ever did anything uh, later in their career that stood out. Um, but looking back, I mean, what other than like the invention of heavy metal, um, and founding work, I mean, what were other influences do you think are overlooked in Sabbath's legacy? Um, certainly visuals. I would say the, uh, I would say their visual aesthetic for sure influenced a lot of bands to come. But, you know, in their defense, I would say, what more do they need to have done? In fairness, what more do they need to have done other than inventing doom metal and then kind of being a part of the creation of 80s heavy metal? What else would we, what else could we possibly have expected from these guys? They've yeah. given us so much. <laughs> yeah. All right. You got a message for the future? Rank up Dio era Sabbath. That's my message. Thank you, Tommy.